Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pokoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being being taught the no no days and the no no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations, they've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious. While peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church law stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair, and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up, watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned, courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture, and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture, it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England, tournaments were in full swing, usually consisting of jousting and melees, a big organized throwdown between knights
nights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church however complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry, if sword fighting isn't your to forte, then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome. You have any cavities? Now you're going to be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really, all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt. We're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar. So fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free. You didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union 
just in case. And finally, number one, pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long toes shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long, and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk. That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently, these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit, and the guy sadly fell in. Now, normally, you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. The poor guy suffocated in his own... What a horrible way to go out. One of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. 
Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and bleh, voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly. Yeah, the poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the Iron Throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go, who to crack in the mic. The Iron Chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking, this one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Fear the Dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, 
I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Number 10. Nightman. Now the name Nightman sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? If you're part of the Nightman, you might be a guild that watches over the dark, you know, protecting people like a superhero team, fighters of the day man, master of karate and all that. Well, if only life were that cool. No, you definitely would not want to be a Nightman. A Nightman was a very polite name for a job that boiled down to guy who cleaned human feces out of the cesspit. Yeah. You ever use a septic tank and thought, wow, this is prehistoric technology? Well, imagine a medieval precursor to a septic tank, if you will, and you've got yourself a cesspit. Easily one of the crappiest jobs in human history. Now the name makes it sound like you'd only be doing this for a few hours, right? Were it so easy, humble nightman? Nightmen would dig for weeks at a time gathering their goods, as they were usually paid by weight, not hours. Consider that, and then consider that any of the lovely amenities you and I have to avoid bacteria, masks, sanitizers, these guys had never even heard of and were shoveling stacks of crap by the literal ton with their hands and faces uncovered, huffing in unimaginable fumes. I imagine that's the kind of work that changes a man on the inside forever. Number 9. Fuller Perhaps one step down from the humble work of shoveling refuse all day like a nightman is the honest life of a fuller. You see, a fuller's job was to remove the oils from cloth woven from sheepskin and wool. Wool, naturally waterproof thanks to the oils on the sheep's skin, but the underside is very coarse and easily frayed and therefore needed to be dealt with before it could be made into things. Nowadays, we would just use an alkaline solution, call it a day. However, back then, chemistry sets weren't really like available, so you'd have to to make do with what you had, right? And what better source of natural alkaline than in pee? Specifically old pee, nice and stale. We're looking for that burnt sienna orange. So the fuller takes the woven wool and cloth, soaks it in a nice giant tub full of old pee, and then stomps on it like you're crushing grapes for wine. Except it's not at all like you're crushing grapes for wine because you're stomping on wool full of old pee. It was fairly common as well for fullers to, uh, to source their own alkaline solution, for lack of a better word. There was no royal distributor of old pee. You couldn't stroll up to the pee man, so they'd have to scrounge and collect it themselves, and if that meant heading to public toilets and private homes, knocking on the front door with their hands held open for a big handout, you know, every drop counts. I can't believe I'm getting paid to say this. Number eight, a whipping boy. Have you ever heard the expression whipping boy to be someone's whipping boy? I know I've certainly heard it a lot, but the history of it is actually pretty fascinating. It was a real position. And basically your whole job as whipping boy was to take the licks for a misbehaving royal. When you have an up and coming noble figure, a prince, a duke, this sort of thing, when they're being taught by their tutors, it would be an unimaginable offense to strike the royal for misbehaving as their status was leagues above the tutors. But you can't have someone misbehaving without any retribution at all, right? A little negative motivation to push you to work harder and learn harder. That is where a whipping boy comes in. The whipping boy, sometimes a friend of the prince being taught, would be struck in front of the prince in order to motivate him to not commit the same transgressions. It seems a bit like a bit of a flawed system because from what I know of medieval European history, it's that kings and princes were rarely remembered for their generosity and compassion for their employees. Now bizarrely, whipping boy was actually seen as a fairly desirable position since it meant you had like an in with the king. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure many young princes saw the guy who was being beaten over the head with a broom and thought this man is my equal and my confidant and a trusted ally. Number 
number seven, Groom of the Stool. Ah, now this is a fancy sounding job title, Groom of the Stool. Got a bit of an air of quality to it. In truth, it actually was a bit of a respected lofty position. You had a very close hand to the royal throne. You had a very close hand to the throne. You had your hand pretty much behind the king's bottom at all times. The groom of the stool, to put it gently, was the royal wiper. You see, there's no one bigger or more important than the king, right? The king is like a god amongst common men, and no god should have to debase themselves to so something as absolutely humiliating, as dehumanizing as using the bathroom by yourself. So that's where the groom of the stool triumphantly strides in, washcloth in hand. You were kept on retainer whenever the king felt nature's call. You were instructed to fetch the chair and take care of business. And the wipe? That's all you. That's all groom of the stool, baby. That's your moment to shine. And you know, a lot of grooms really got creative with this. They could show off their style, technique, wrist control. There's a lot of artistry to it that I think people realized. The groom of the king did more than just fetching and wiping too. As the man most connected with royal stool, the groom also shared the responsibility of monitoring what was going on down there for any changes in the king's health. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but much heavier is the hand that wipes the bottom. Number six, cat gut. Okay, in contrast to the last one that had a nice name, this one has a disgusting name, cat gut. Way back when in yesteryear, they didn't have the same tools available to us now when crafting musical instruments, so they had to get creative. If you wanted to hear something beautiful on violin, you couldn't just head on down to Long and McQuaid and pick up a pack of strings. You'd need a guy willing to get his hands wrist deep in some cat gut. Now, confusingly, no actual cats were involved, but plenty of sheep were. Violin strings were made of sheep's guts, and they would make the strings by twisting strands of sheep's intestines and innards together. Lovely. They'd have to be careful while butchering the animals to make sure they didn't accidentally harm any of the goods. This process would take hours out of time, from the butchering, the careful removal of the organs, and then they needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution to be clean since they were inside a sheep, and then stared at for a few hours to make sure nothing was going wrong, and then the drying process could begin. They say there is nothing more exciting than watching sheep guts dry. And then you can get your twist on, make them into violin. Absolutely disgusting, but when you hear the sweet strings of Ave Maria and you hear how finely tuned those sheep intestines are, you know it's all worth it. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card, just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football in Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm uh, 
I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Ah, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. What do you think? Genius? Or did the guy have some help? One man in his time plays many parts. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Hera C. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out. Yeah, I read your comments. Okay, and now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart. Let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders, or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united, single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number nine, facial expressions. I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen. Quite frankly, I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that. Which is fine, to be honest with you. I I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, Nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that, imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not, probably not. Macy Williams is just. In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. 
The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment? Well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the Middle Ages, you didn't have a fork. No one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so. Until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you ugh, would choke on it because it's horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink, like what, you know, like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people, nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that. Don't, don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, 
Dad's happy with it. Mom's happy. You got a blushing bride. What more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed to ye the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just... Do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring you down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale. Like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't don't lose your blood for to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen in TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, at it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Yeah, chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Treaty de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. 
Shawshank Redemption 2, Medieval Edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid-1100s during England's Civil War. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight, stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This was like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance and literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These are the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? 
Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Children's Crusade is number five. Joining where the wild things are and labyrinth for most bratty and annoying kids is a boy in some stories named Steven, who claimed to have been given a divine message from God to go forth and conquer the world. He was 12. Anyways, Steven approached many royals looking for resources only to be turned away. He even asked for the support of King Philip of France, who very rationally told the kid to go back home before bedtime. This was directly after the Holy Land Crusade, so it was mainly due to the fact that they believed he wanted to live out a hero legacy like his idols because he was 12. Like prepubescent boys, Stephen wasn't going to drop it when told no. He instead started preaching and recruited a band of faithful children to lead them into the Holy Land. One day, having found someone to supply his large gaggle of children, reportedly over a thousand, with a boat, Stephen loaded everyone up unarmed and unprepared and took to the seas. They were never seen again. It's believed Stephen's ship sank or the children were stolen by the ship crew and brought to Egypt for other unfortunate purposes. No matter what happened, the preachings of Stephen led to what's believed somewhat between a thousand and ten thousand children to their demise. Stephen is one of few documented children crusaders, none of which can technically even be labeled as a crusade because to fall under that title a mission had to be delivered and blessed by a pope. No children's crusade was ever approved. Speaking of holy crusaders, the fate of the Templars is number four in our countdown. Founded in 1118 as a monstatic military, their duty was the protection of pilgrims as they traveled to the Holy Land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem. Jerusalem during the First Crusade. The Knights of Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups of the Middle and Dark Ages, erecting banks, castles, and churches. Their wealth would be their downfall. A secret letter detailed black magic and scandalous sexual activities that was sent through France. The reality of this document was that it was made by King Philip of France, who notoriously stole and plundered from anyone he could. In response, more than 600 Templars are arrested, as well as hundreds of non-warriors who handled the day-to-day -day work such as banking, farming, and Organizing. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses including heresy, devil worship, spitting on the cross, homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. The Templars, meanwhile, were kept in isolation and fed meager rations, all while facing brutal torture. Given the extreme conditions of medieval methods, it's not a surprise within weeks, hundreds of Templars just confessed to false charges. Their lands and money were confiscated and officially dispersed to another religious order, the Hospitallers, although greedy Philip did get his hands on some of the cash he coveted. Didn't know this guy was real, but the Pied Piper is number three. The proof is etched in the Hamlinia face itself, an inscribed plaque on the stone facade of the so-called Pied Piper's house dating to 1602 reads, AD 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, children Children born in Hamlin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing the Calvary near Copenburg, they disappeared forever. The tale, in fact, has survived a very long time. Originating as medieval folklore, it inspired the Grimm Brothers legend, The Children of Hamlin, and one of Robert Browning's best known poems, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. While there are some small differences in the stories, the basics remain the same. The piper was hired by the people of Hamlin to rid the town of rats. Trailing after their hypnotic notes, the rat catcher and his magical flute made them go to their demise. But when the town refused to pay the piper for his service, the savior came for Hamlin's children. Entranced by the notes of his magic flute, the boys and girls followed the piper out of town and simply vanished. So what happened to Hamlin's children? One theory is that the Pied Piper played the role of a so-called locator or recruiter. They were responsible for organizing migrations to the east, and they were said to worn colorful garments and played an instrument to attract the attention of possible settlers. Popular opinion is, if this is the case, the children may have been taken to the Berlin area. As the family names common in Hamlin at the time, show up in surprising frequency in areas of Uckermark and Przenich near Berlin. An entry in Hamlin's town records dating 1384 laments that it's a hundred years since our children left. The stained glass window in town St. Nikolai Church, destroyed in the 17th century but described in earlier accounts, reportedly illustrated the figure of the Pied Piper leading ghostly white children away. And St. Anthony's fire number two in the countdown is not as cool as it may sound. When people of Paris were tormented with painful boil sore swelling and the sensation of fire in their skin, the only cure seemed to be a trip to St. Mary's Church in Paris. There, Duke Hugh the Great nourished the ill with his holy grain stores, said to help the ill recover. And they did. But as soon as they returned home, they had the plague again with terrible illness. The cause? St. Anthony's fire. The disease starts with faint burning in the skin. Soon red spots covered the infected person's body, who felt like their limbs were on fire. Arms would swell and turn bright red, then terrible hallucinations would plague them, convincing them they were being assaulted by demons or dragged to hell. Finally, gangrene 
pain would set in and the victim's fingers and toes would drop off one by one. Once infected, few survived. So what caused this horrible disease and why did Holy Grain cure it? Well, if you've seen our video Top 10 Unusual Events from Medieval History, you may know about ergot poisoning. It's a fungus that grows on rye during cold and damp conditions. When the grain is ground up and then made into bread, people consume the fungus and poisoning ensures. So do cues stores of holy grain were better maintained because of his status and they weren't contaminated with ergot. When people ate his grains, their ergotism went away, but as soon as they returned home and they consumed their contaminated grains, they were poisoned again. Ergot would remain undiscovered still for years to come, and many forms of ergot poisoning would manifest in this time. Number one takes the video title seriously though, The Dark Age. It's said the ninth plague of Egypt was complete darkness that lasted for three days. Well, this may not be entirely wrong, with the exception of it actually being eight 18 months. In 536 AD, it said a huge portion of our world went under a dark, mysterious fog that fell on Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. The fog blocked the sun during the day, causing temperatures to drop, crops to fail, and people to die. As a result, countless documents were found in this country of mysterious darkness. However, they weren't taken seriously until the 1990s when researchers in Ireland noticed the rings on the inside of trees indicated some funny business around 536. Summers in Europe and Asia became 35 Fahrenheit to 37 Fahrenheit colder, China even reporting summer snow. They realized that the ancient witnesses were really actually onto something. They weren't being hysterical or imagining the end of the world. Now researchers also discovered what may be the main source of the darkness. A volcanic eruption in Iceland in early 536 helped spread ash across the northern hemisphere, creating a fog and altering the global climate patterns causing years of famine. With this realization, accounts of 536 become real horrifying real fast. I mean, put it in perspective. One day the world is plunged into darkness and then the sun just never rises again. In primitive times especially, this seemed to have a traumatic effect. We marvel to see no shadows at our, of our body at new, wrote Cassiodorus, a Roman politician. He also wrote that the sun had a bluish color and the moon had lost its luster and the seasons seemed to become jumbled together. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women, they don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? 
That's right, animals being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathersworth, peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, Your Honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages, the end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn and quartered. Like why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death aka pestilence, aka the great mortality or simply known as the plague. Single handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. Uh, I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Sin Eater. This is one of the most metal job titles around. I'm pretty sure the Sin Eater was a boss in Elden Ring, wasn't he? He's in Kaelid somewhere. This is definitely one of the more unholy jobs in this list. Not as disgusting as gut stringing or crap slinging, but pretty horrid in its own right. Sin Eaters ate sins, and the best way to eat a metaphorical concept of wrongdoing was to eat bread off the corpse of someone who died recently. The idea being that the sins of the man would be transferred onto the bread? I don't know. Anyway, they eat the sins and the deceased gets to go off to heaven without worrying about their history, could go on peacefully, and the sin eaters make some coin. They were willing to take a risk dooming their mortal soul for a bit of coin. Man's gotta eat. I wonder though, is it worth it? Like what if you eat too many sins and you don't have any room for dessert? Do sins have an added flavor? I imagine it's got like just a little kick, like a sriracha, like it's a little hot on your tongue. Number four, lime burner. Now a lime burner doesn't sound so bad at first. Lime mortar is a common building material, being traced back to the first century, but it's not particularly easy to work with. Bear with me while I try to explain the technicals, I'm not as smart as a first century engineer, you see. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, taking the stone and cooking it in a kiln at around a cool 800 degrees. It's not too bad, right? Well that carbon monoxide has got to go somewhere, mostly in the air. All that carbon monoxide and dust chalk would just float around in the air where you'd be taking big heavy deep breaths in and I'm not sure how much you know about carbon monoxide but it's consistently the number one spot on Rolling Stones magazine list of top 100 substances to not breathe in. On top of this, did you know that superheated lime mortar is violently volatile against water? Meaning that if you were to sue, you know, sweat in a building that was 800 degrees at any given time, it would have disastrous consequences. Be careful. Number three, rat catcher. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's exactly what it says in the tin. You catch rats. You gotta wonder why you wouldn't just outsource this to the cat community. They're very good at this sort of thing. Rats, cute as I find them, at the time were filled to bursting with plague, disease, all kinds of grossness. Castle stock rooms were filled with grain, vegetables, and herbs, and if you're a rat, those are the things that make life worthwhile. Rats were a problem for nobility, but an even bigger issue for common folk and peasants, because if these little rats ate up what little grain you had, 
you would go destitute fast. But oh, come on, who can say no to their little posies and their little eyesies? I'm biased, I love rats. I would be a rat catcher if I could. Some rat catchers allegedly were reported to have raised their own supply of rats in order to squeak a few extra dollars out of the town. That's hilarious, by the way, love that scheme. Now traditionally, their methods would involve things like leaving out traps or poisoned herbs. That wasn't always enough though, so rat catchers would also invoke the old methods, namely magic, and try to entice rats away with spells. This often didn't work terribly well since rats are naturally resistant to magic, like everybody knows this. Number two, plague bearer. The plague ravaged London and Europe, leaving behind a wake of bodies and a stack of corpses as high as your medieval eyes could see. So somebody had to deal with all of that, right? A street sweeper of sorts was needed. You remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when Eric Idle is going around ringing his little bell, telling everyone to come bring out their dead? Hilarious, right? Well, it's partly based on reality because this is more or less what a plague bearer really was. The parish would hire out plague bearers who would then tour the streets of the village or town or whatever, wagon in hand, collecting the bodies of the ailing and dead to go dump in a mass graveyard shortly after. Tons of fun! They would spend their nights surrounded by dead bodies and their days in the church with the same dead bodies because according to the church's law, they were required to live there to prevent spreading what they were dealing with to anyone else. This might be history's first case of social distancing. And finally, at number one of the jobs you don't want is executioner. We've all heard of this one, and we're probably conjuring up a pretty vivid image of a burly shirtless monster in a black hood with a big ol' axe or something, wielded by someone who can't get enough of their day job and love their passion of separating necks from heads. In actuality, medieval people weren't that psychotic, and most executioners didn't join the practice out of a love of the game, but were usually coerced into it. Some were butchers who were called to the job, some were criminals who could do the job in exchange for a reduced sentence, but most commonly, it was a family business. If your dad was the town executioner, it was very likely you would be next in line to wear the hood. Now the downsides to this job seem immediately obvious, unless you're super into bloodshed and death, it's Probably not the cheeriest job. Seems like the kind of thing you'd, you'd take home with you, you know? Kind of hard to lay loose and relax after that. But you know what's worse than the weight of taking another man's life? Social isolation. Executioners were not particularly well liked, looked down upon as outcasts, sometimes even forced to live outside of town. Ah, uh, well, you know what, executioner? It could be worse. You could be the groom of the stool, or you could be a nightman, so count your blessings. Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start, and where, and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic, if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like, this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the Middle Ages had some some good traditions, along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand to hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to William's continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient 
British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard the First, leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. PETA would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, also isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah. Prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your Honor, a small recess, please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that... And remember, when meeting a beloved, dress to impress. But not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumptuary laws exist. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a date to wear their best gown and hose which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video, Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed, to learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family, home of your potential lover, and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed, and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food, but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carried the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating, but don't eat with it. 5. Okay. If it's a liquid, use a spoon. People 
people tended to eat with their hands for everything else. Six, don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And seven, you can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so. And eight, remember you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously some of these things like wiping your hands on a tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the middle ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling, bro. I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the Middle Ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples. Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away. Romeo and Juliet taking their lives, and the raving madness of Ophelia. But these are just dramatizations, right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled. But with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society, the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot. So let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up. So let's run through the list. First, pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful, and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin, such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hare's blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured. Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the Middle Ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake them into a powder, and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly, or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal in this one. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? 
Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, yeah, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights in you know, the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was, was no funny business. That was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go. Just show up and fart and be funny. 
have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy. You just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family. Thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter, it's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pool vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches, people who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial. Actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep. I wonder what house this pig would belong to. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so, you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. 
That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away, still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. 
Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number seven, Fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number six, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people, and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with Ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number four, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of defender of the faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> do you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, 
you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval Times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics, and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queez hit night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time a side in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things and we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls, now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, public de-lifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, fr it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just to make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common. That's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. 
Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re mi, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I am moderately talented and handsome, and have a great following. But I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> Villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, <laughs> not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five. The Great Charter. Ah yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty. The initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow. Like, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the Law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Templars. Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter, and tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Pateur was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, 
The jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town. And no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, so this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, there is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment, such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn, like band band, huh? Thankfully, the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right, just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. Number 10, where's my mummy? Interior of a kitchen, oil on canvas, by Martin Drolling was painted in 1815 and depicts shades of browns, tans, beiges, and golds that were remarkable of the era. Where did he get these colors, some had wondered. Well, good old Martin had a little help from the dead. Mummy Brown was appropriately named as it was made up of, you guessed it, ground up mummies. From the 16th to the 19th century, many painters favored the pigment and it remained available well into the 20th century, even as supplies dwindled. Egyptian mummies are rare nowadays, not because a few survived thousands of years in their tombs, but because few survived the aesthetic and cannibal demands of Europeans. Eating Egyptian mummies reached its peak in Europe by the 16th century. Mummies could be found on apothecary shelves, either in broken shards or ground into powder. So why did these nutcase Europeans believe that there was medicinal value in a mummy? Bitumen. Abundant in the Middle East, where formed in geological basins of the remains of tiny plants and animals, it could be semi-liquid or semi-solid. It is viscous when heated and hardened when dried, making it useful for broken bones and rashes. Supposedly, bitumen with wine cured chronic coughs, and combined with vinegar, it'll dissolve clotted blood. Other uses included the treatment of cataracts, toothaches, and skin disease. Because of the stickiness, it was called mum or mummia. You see where the mix-up is coming in? So when the invasive colonial Europeans saw the black stuff coating these ancient remains for the first time, they assumed it to be that valuable bitumen, or mummia, they'd heard about. They were quick to start gobbling it down. The mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs were sold as medicine in Germany well into the 20th century. And Speaking of the dead, how about using them for decor? Ballroom of bones is number nine. Not all bones are tasty enough to eat, and sometimes you got more of them than you can handle. So that's where ossuaries come in. In older times when people perished, often before 50, there was obviously a lot more human remains to be disposed of. But sometimes there's not more space. So as a space saving technique, the skeletal remains of buried bodies would be dug up and moved into underground crypts called ossuaries. Many more remains could be stored that way as bones didn't need the whole space Face that a body did and could also be stacked, hung, or broken into position. The Brno ossuary in the Czech Republic is the second biggest in Europe, featuring chandeliers, artwork, words, crosses, really anything that can be made up of bones. These structures and pieces can be incredibly elaborate. Hall State Charnel House features hundreds of hand-painted skulls, and the Sadlik Church ossuary even features a large crown made up of human remains hanging over the pew where they preach from. If you're goth, you may want to consider that for a marriage location. Let's get hot with Greek fire in at number eight. Greek fire, arguably the Jesus of the flame world for its ability to walk on water, baffles historians and scientists alike to this day. Invented in the Byzantine Empire in the seventh century, this fire was used to defend their empire from invaders. Countless documentation verifies to us today that the stories of this fire was very real, but because its formula was a state secret, nobody's quite sure what it was used to create this liquid. The substance could be thrown in pots or shot from tubes. It apparently caught fire spontaneously 
instantaneously and could not be extinguished with water. It could burn on top of it. It was heated and pressurized, then delivered via a tube called a siphon at the Grecian enemies. What's truly fascinating about Greek fire is that armies who captured the liquid concoction were unable to recreate it for themselves. They also failed to recreate the machine that it was delivered from. To this day, nobody knows exactly what the ingredients went into this mixture. Dance the day, night, and your life away with number 7 in the countdown. The Kavik incident is one of the first few recorded instances of dancing plagues. Later, there are stories of unstoppable, sometimes fatal, dancing in the German town Ephraim in 1247. Shortly after, 200 people are said to have danced themselves all over a bridge of the Moselle River in Maastricht until it collapsed, drowning them all. The 1518 event was most thoroughly documented and probably the last of several such outbreaks in Europe, which took place largely between the 10th and the 16th centuries. A woman reportedly stepped into the street and began dancing, seemingly unable to stop, and she kept dancing until she collapsed from exhaustion. After resting, she resumed the compulsive frenzied activity. The more she continued, the more others were afflicted, and within a week, 30 others mimicked her strange behavior. Alarmed city officials thought maybe more or better dancing was the solution, so they gathered up the real pros and some music and arranged dancing halls to help the afflicted boogie this out. Instead, the opposite happened, and now as many as 400 people were consumed by the dancing compulsion. A number of them died from their exertions. In early September, the mania began to abate, and that's the last we know of this phenomena. So what is this plague, and why were all these people dancing themselves to doom. Well, the explanation at the time was the usual stuff like demonic possession or your blood was too hot. Modern day, it's likely because of ergot poisoning from molding rye flour used to make their bread, as it's been known to cause hysteria and convulsions. To this day, hundreds of accounts of dancing plagues are found recorded in dark ages, but we have no explanation as to why. I don't see dead people, I see green people. The Woolpit alien children are number six in our countdown. Two English chroniclers reported a story from the 12th century that villagers of Woolpit discovered two two children, a brother and sister, who had green skin and spoke an unknown language. The children were quickly taken to higher officials, Richard D. Colney's house, where he attempted to communicate and failed. The children also refused to eat for days on end until seeing green beans in the garden, which they ate straight out of the ground. They stayed with Richard long term as he converted them to a normal diet and they started to lose the green pigmentation. Obviously after time and growth these children learned English and when they were asked where they were from they told Richard, we are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. They further explained that where they were from, everything was green, and they had been tending to their father's animals that they followed into a cave. Emerging out of it, they found themselves in Woolpit. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen. Our land is little cheered by its beams. We are contented with that twilight, which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover, a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by a very but considerable river. Shortly after this description of a non-existent land, Richard took the children to be baptized in a local church. However, the boy died very shortly after from an unknown illness. The girl known as Agnes grew into adulthood and married. She remained private and spoke little to many. And so, the secret of their original homeland died with her. Number five. Groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool, though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, had good benefits. Back in the Dark Ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII, and this role was to assist the king, and specifically, assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps. Thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history. Maybe. We're almost there. You'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. 
If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's a poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you wanna be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. 
Johnny Depp needs your help right now. So maybe, maybe be a lawyer. Call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight, and like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Ugh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number 8. Ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there, whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice. It could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, war of the bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Modo I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because it's a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes, <laughs> ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil, get him. Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Rouen, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples as sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. At number five, bear leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. And number four, the piss prophet. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. 
Now I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, Muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there's another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food and entrails, had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? And number 2, Arming Squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. I'm finally a number one, Peer Finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. I'll see myself out. <laughs>